David Cobb. Can we put our hands together? Thank you so much, David. Thank you so much. It is, it is really such a pleasure to be back in Texas, uh, where people don't talk funny. That's great. <laughs> uh, before I begin, I want to really thank Lee and Hardy Lowe for opening up their homes as they have done so often, so many times, and for so long. So thank you, Lee and Hardy Lowe, for this. You know, when I begin these presentations, I always like to say, my name is David Cobb. I am a proud, I am a patriotic, and these days I am a pissed off American citizen. <laughs> And I mean that very sincerely, and I say it because I think that we as progressives make a profound mistake if we allow the Tea Party to claim some sort of monopoly on political anger in this country. Because if you actually talk to a Tea Party person uh, and you get down to issues and you find out, you know, why are you angry? What you find is they'll typically tell you, well, I'm mad because Wall Street America, the big banks, Corporations destroyed the economy, and then the federal government rewarded them with a trillion dollars of our tax money. Well, you know what? I'm angry about that too. Aren't you? Yeah. yeah. And we can't we can't allow the Tea Party to be the only outlet for a kind of political anger about the usurpation of our government. And I'll go one step further and tell you that I think that the anger that I feel actually goes beyond that. Because I'm also angry about the fact that 25% of the children in this country, the richest country the world has ever produced, are going to bed hungry. That also makes me angry. I'm angry that we live in a society that is fundamentally racist and class oppressive. That also makes me angry. I'm angry about the fact that the industrial society in which we're living are literally destroying the planet. You see, I think as progressives, we need to be able to articulate the kind of anger that we feel because that anger is a righteous anger. And I use that word very carefully. It truly is a righteous anger. In fact, it's the same kind of righteous anger that we're feeling now that propelled those folks to stand up against the abomination of slavery in this country. You see, abolitionists were righteously angry at that institution. So too were those women who gathered in Seneca Falls, New York, whenever they were challenging the patriarchal system that did not treat them equally or fairly. They were righteously angry about that. In fact, I would tell you that the trade union movement, the civil rights movement, Basically, all of the great movements of this society, of our great country, all of our social movements are driven by what I can only call righteous anger. And I want to say that anger alone is a very dangerous thing. It is emotionally dangerous, it's physically dangerous, it's spiritually dangerous. You see, if you get angry and you just stew in anger, that's a very bad thing. If you instead understand why you're angry and then allow your anger to propel you into righteous action, that's the sweet spot. That's actually what will put you in a position to be able to join the growing movements in this country. And because we're speaking on October 4th, as things are gearing up, can I just say, occupy Wall Street, occupy Houston, occupy everywhere. All right? <laughs> What is happening? And I gotta say too, since we have a, a, a candidate for office, uh, Mr. Sure. Don. Amy's here now. Oh, Amy is here. Hello, Amy. It's a pleasure to meet you, Amy Price. Don Cook. Occupy everywhere, including the ballot box. Yeah. Right. All right. So you know, I said that I was a proud and patriotic and pissed off American. You know, I'm also kind of sad because I can remember when I could say I was a proud and patriotic American without any other qualifier. And for me, that's when I was a little boy. When I was taught that I was from the United States of America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, that I was from the United States of America, and that meant that I stood for liberty and justice and equality. And I was so proud to be from that country. And not only would my country guarantee liberty and justice and equality for everybody who lived here, but my country was like some great shining light on the hill. And we were going to guarantee liberty and justice and equality for everybody on earth. I was so proud of me. I was so proud of us. And when I grew up, I realized I had been lied to. 
And so, of course, I'm angry. But i got to say something, folks. I can actually remember the face that I have associated with that. I won't call it a lie anymore. I'll just call it a creation myth. Because the person that I associate that story with is actually Mrs. Armstrong, my fifth grade teacher. And can I ask, are there any public teachers or former public teachers in the crowd here? Can we give a round of applause to our public teachers? And I mean this very seriously because I don't think that we give enough honor to public teachers. We don't give enough respect to public teachers. We damn sure don't give enough money to public teachers. And I also want to say that in honor of Mrs. Armstrong. Because, you see, I remember her. Mrs. Armstrong did not go to bed at night saying, Wah, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> I can't wait until these children come into the classroom so I can fill their mind full of lies and propaganda. No, absolutely not. Mrs. Armstrong was a public school teacher. And like every other public school teacher I've had the privilege of knowing, she became a teacher because she wanted to teach. She wanted to help inspire and uh, help to propel children to have them challenge themselves and become productive members of society. You see, Mrs. Armstrong told that story because she believed it. And I'll tell you another thing, as I'm looking at this crowd and looking at how you're reacting, I think you believed it too. I know I did, and I know that my classmates did. And may I suggest that the reason that I believed it, that my classmates believed it, that you believed it, is because you want to believe it. You desperately want to live in liberty and justice and equality. And may I suggest that that is not because we're Americans. It's because we're human beings. And I think that is so important for us to recognize that liberty and justice and equality are fundamentally human desires. You see, Iraqi children want that too as do Afghani children and Israeli children and Palestinian children and Mexican children and Senegalese children. In fact, at the end of the day, let's just acknowledge that these desires are human desires. And if we're really going to deal with the multiple problems that are facing us, both as a society, as a civilization today, we're going to have to stop thinking only about the nation state and we're going to have to start talking about the human race. Thank you. We need to start talking about a human rights movement. And I'm very proud and very happy to tell you that I know that that's happening. Now, you know, we're in a public space here, and as a result, I think that it's really important that we actually honor the fact that as we're coming together, that we're going to make a commitment, and I'm going to make a commitment to you to tell the truth. Because, you see, I think that the problems that we're facing, and they are multiple, right? We're not just in a crisis, we're really in a series of crises. They're like crises of crises that are sort of uh, building, and as a result, I think it's really important that we understand, talk honestly and clearly and coherently about exactly what it is that we're facing, because that's the only way that we'll be able to actually determine what we should do. And I say that very sincerely, we need to understand and diagnose the problem. Not so that we can merely wallow in it or wallow in our corrective, you know, how correct we are, but in the same sense that a doctor, she or he gets a diagnosis in order to have a treatment regimen. You see, I'm here to tell you that there is a treatment regimen, even as difficult as the situation is, and it is difficult, there are very clear steps that we can begin taking as a country, as a people, as a movement and they are beginning to be taken and so my first pledge to you is to tell the truth and in so doing I'm going to start by saying this the United States of America is a fundamentally racist sexist and class oppressive society and the economic institutions are destroying the ecosystem upon which we all depend for life itself yes. how's that <laughs> you know it's harder than you think perhaps, to actually stand up in a public space like this with so many uh, people looking at you and telling that truth, even though we know it's true, because our society has tried to teach us not to say those things out loud. And for me, I find it liberating. I actually find it liberating when I, I stop actually trying to, to find ways not to offend people. Instead, I don't want to offend people. I really don't. But I do want to effectively and honestly communicate. 
And so I think that we need to actually talk about just how serious the problems are. And since that went so well, I'll tell another truth. <laughs> the United States of America is not now, it wasn't designed to be, and it has never actually been a functioning democracy. Yeah? yeah? Make sense? Yeah. Good. All right, so I think I'm in the right place. <laughs> and so I will now, in that spirit of truth telling, try to basically tell a story for how I think that we've come to be in really the desperate situation that we're in, again, so that we can figure out how to proceed. In order to tell this story, I'm going to make sure to cover four basic concepts. The first concept is democracy. I've written it on the board, the word democracy. That word gets thrown around a lot. In order to get some clarity, let me ask you, what language is this from? Greek. Greek. It's from Greek. Let's break it down. Demos means? People. The people. Kratia means? Rule or govern. So the word democracy literally means the people rule or the people govern. So here's a question. How many people believe that we the people are ruling in the United States today? Don't be shy. <laughs> right? I mean, I do this presentation all across the country, and it's very rare that anybody can actually assert uh, that we the people are actually ruling. You know, and I think that on the one, sometimes I say, and that's a problem, y'all. On the other hand, I gotta say, I actually think it's a good thing. Not that we don't rule, but that people are disabusing themselves of the mistaken belief that we are ruling ourselves. Because frankly, I think that the biggest threat to democracy in the United States of America is the mistaken belief that we're actually living in one. I think that as more and more people are coming to terms with the difficult reality of the fact that we the people are not ruling in this country, it's actually providing us with the clarity that we need in order to move forward. And frankly, I think that clarity is part of the reason that you're seeing a movement to occupy Wall Street. It's part of the reason that you're seeing a call to occupy Washington, D.C. on October 6th. I think it's part of the reason that you're actually seeing a full-fledged social movement in the United States of America today, and that's obviously a good thing. The next topic I want to cover is sovereignty. Can anybody give me a three or four definition of sovereignty? Or how about this? If instead I just talked about sovereign, what would you think of? Self-governing. King. The king. king. Right, because so the king, the sovereignty doesn't mean self-governing. Right. I mean, we're taught that we self-govern. Wink, wink. <laughs> but sovereignty means the authority to rule. And in fact, 500 years ago, if you said sovereign, it was synonymous with the king. Because the king had ultimate authority to rule. And where, by the way, did the king claim authority to rule? God. God. <laughs> George, you don't get much more legitimate. <laughs> I mean, if you can assert that, that your power to rule comes from on high and have everybody else believe it, that's pretty powerful. In fact, to illustrate that, I'm going to do a little exercise. This is always a lot of fun for me. You'll see. I'm going to invite this entire crowd to please close your eyes and repeat after me. David Cobb is the king. <laughs> and as the king... David is God's representative on earth. And therefore, everything David says must be obeyed. Okay, you can go open your eyes. I, I just want to point out a couple of things. First of all, all of you laughed at that, right? Don, George, several of you refused to go along. I thought there might be a mutiny on my hands. And I want to point out that that's also a good thing, right? I mean, why did you laugh at that? Because it's funny. I mean, it's beyond funny. It's, it's, it's a type of humor called absurd, right? Mm -hmm. To say that I can say how you should live your life, or even better, how all of society should organize their life just because of who my parents are, that's absurd. That's laughable. That's ridiculous. And 500 years ago, people just like you not only said it, but they thought it. And if they didn't think it, they knew better than to say it out loud. And I say that to really drive home the point that only 500 years ago, human beings just like us could not even wrap their heads around anything other than the divine right of kings and the king having ultimate authority to rule, and you in this crowd can't even say it without snickering. 